And welcome to Nats Chat for Wednesday, May 15th, 2024, along with MassInSports.com Nationals insider Mark Zuckerman, who was at Guaranteed Rate Field in Chicago. I'm Al Galdi, host of the Al Galdi podcast. A doubleheader split for the Nats at the American League worst Chicago White Sox on Tuesday for the first two games of a three-game series off a rainout on Monday night. Game one on Tuesday, a 6-3 Nats win, but game two on Tuesday night, a 4-0 Nats loss. The Nats for this regular season fall to 20 and 21. The White Sox now are an American League worst 13 and 30. This episode of the Nats Chat podcast is brought to us by Roaming Rooster. Roaming Rooster is proudly stationed in section 239 in left center field at Nationals Park, adding flavor to every game day experience that's Roaming Rooster in section 239. Coming up later in the show, we have another shout out to deliver. If you would like to send a shout out to someone who you care about via this podcast, email Tim Shovers at Nats Chat Podcast at gmail.com. The Nats took Eric Fetty with the number 18 overall pick in the 2014 MLB draft out of the University of Nevada. He, with the Nats, pitched in six major league regular seasons, 2017 through 2022, 102 games, including 88 starts, ERA of 541. He then pitched in the KBO, the Korean Baseball Organization, for the 2023 season. He, in the KBO, did quite well, won the KBO's equivalent of the Cy Young Award, and he, this season, for the White Sox, is doing quite well. And he, on Tuesday night, did very well against the Nets. Seven scoreless innings, six strikeouts, no walks. Betty, for this regular season with the White Sox, nine starts, ERA at 260, whip of 1.06. Now, we shall see if this success for Fetty with the White Sox lasts, because Fetty with the Nats had pockets of success, but never lasting success. But Mark, and you wrote about this for MassInSports.com, Fetty in the KBO, Fetty now for the White Sox. This is not the Fetty who we came to know with the Nats. No, it is not. He is a different pitcher now, and to hear him talk about it, he kind of needed the Nats to let him go and to go rediscover himself in Korea to become this pitcher. Now, whether he continues to do this or not, like you said, we will see. But so far, this is a continuation of what he did last year overseas. And there's a little bit difference in the repertoire. Um, he's really worked on a, a, a changeup. It was also called a splitter. I'm not sure what officially it is. Uh, and he's throwing a, a sweeper now instead of a big curveball. So a little more velocity, throwing it with more horizontal break. But what he said, it really did. It gives him four pitches that he feels confident. And I, to me, the biggest thing I got out of him is how much more confidence he has in himself. And I, I found this really interesting myself. We talked about how all his time here in D.C., I know he was a first-round pick, but he was part of a rotation that included the likes of Max Scherzer, Steven Strasburg, Gio Gonzalez, Patrick Corbin, uh, Anibal Sanchez. He was always perpetually the number five guy and not even always guaranteed of the fifth spot. And in his own mind, I think he allowed that to uh, dictate the way that he would go about it. And in his mind, hey, just give him five decent innings and I'm good. How many times we talk about Fetty just five and dive with him? He goes over to Korea, gets a million dollar deal, and all of a sudden the attention is on him and he's expected to pitch like an ace. And he started thinking to himself, you know what? Five is not good enough. I need to be a guy who can be counted on to go seven and to pitch really well and lead the way. And having rediscovered that, getting the two-year contract here to come back, he's tried to take that same mindset into his starts now. He's been fantastic for them. And yes, he's had a few starts like this during his time in D.C., but I think what you saw in this game and really over the course of the last month and a half with Chicago, he is a different pitcher. And it's it's the stuff, but it's also the mindset that he's taking to this. And a lot of people are happy for him. They wish it didn't happen against the Nats, but a lot of people really like him personally and are happy that he's having success now. I am anxious to see if this continues. He did pitch like this, as we remember, in the 2022 season. Got off to a good start, and then things came tumbling down. So we'll see if this continues. Uh, by the way, I appreciated in your piece on MassInSports.com the nod to the epic duels. Fetty, Austin Voth, Joe Ross battling for that number five spot in the Nats rotation. It felt like every year for uh, many, many years. You know, I think if this was happening a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, this would be really painful. You know, this guy blossoming somewhere else. I think that we see the Nats doing the work that they're doing with the likes of Jake Irvin and Mitchell Parker and Mackenzie Gore and Josiah Gray. 
I think that softens the blow of this. Now, I think there are questions to ask of, geez, how come he never looked like this consistently with the Nats? But again, let's see if this continues. I, I don't think we should go overboard with Fetty now being an entirely new pitcher just yet. Uh, but yeah, it was impressive what he did uh, on Tuesday night, to be sure. The Nats uh, had a mixed offensive day in this doubleheader split at the White Sox. A 6-3 win in Game 1. The Nats were good offensively. Six runs, 10 hits, uh, though all of them were singles. But 10 hits, four walks, four for 11 with runners in scoring position. But the 4 nothing loss on Tuesday night, no runs, just four hits, which were a double and three singles. The Nats did work three walks, but the Nats went 0 for 8 with runners in scoring position. The day was almost like a microcosm of the Nats offensively this season. The Nats can be quite good offensively. They also can be quite bad, and we saw both uh, on Tuesday. I think it comes down to to two factors that we've seen consistently from them. Number one, can they not just get on base with singles, but can they work the count? Can they draw some walks? Usually the games where they do get on base by being more patient uh, ends up being better games. So that's number one. And then number two, can they deliver in those clutch spots with runners in scoring position? They certainly didn't do it in the nightcap, but honestly, they didn't do it in the first game until the eighth inning, really. Uh, Prior to that point, they were two for eight with runners in scoring position. They were 0 for four through the first four innings. So they they do usually give themselves opportunities. But as we've talked about, if your offense relies on singles and walks and occasional double, you're going to have to string hits together. And so you're going to have at-bats with runners in scoring position. You can't count on getting three runs on one swing of the bat. Uh, You've got to deliver in those spots when you do get them. And I, I think that's what we're seeing from them. There are nights when it does come together at the right moments and they can score some runs. Um, but on the nights they don't, they just don't have any other way of going about it. And I think you saw that in the nightcap. Big game for Joey Manessis in game one. He, for each game of this doubleheader, was an at starting first baseman and cleanup batter. He, in game one, went four for four with a two run single and three other singles. Manessis, top of the first two out single in the left field. Manessis, top of the fourth, leadoff opposite field single to right field. On a one-two pitch, Manessis in an ads a three-run fifth, a two-out first pitch, a two-run single through the left side of the infield for a three-one Nats lead, and Manessis in an ads three-run eighth, a leadoff single to left field. Despite having been down to the count at one point one two, Manessis in game two of the doubleheader, zero for three with a walk and two strikeouts. Manessis overall is not having a good season. We've seen signs of him maybe starting to bust out, but then inevitably he kind of goes back to struggling. But it's interesting. Davey Martinez has been almost like militant. Manessas bats high up in the lineup. Number three spot, number four spot, maybe number five. Uh, Had a good game in game one of this series. But, you know, we've seen other Nats move around the lineup this season. We saw Trey Lipscomb all over the place over the course of uh, this doubleheader in terms of where he batted. But Davey really has stuck to Manessas batting uh, in a premium spot. Yeah, I think there was a game or two that he was maybe down to sixth. But I think that's the lowest that he's been for the most part, he's up there. I think, you know, it's a byproduct of who they have and how few guys they've had staying hot at any given time this year. But I think it's also this feeling that while he doesn't do a lot of things well lately, he's certainly not hitting the ball with authority, he still does have that chance with runners in scoring position to just hit a single up the middle to the right side, whatever that is. Um, It's not been a great season by any stretch. It does lead them now in RBIs uh, for whatever that is worth. So I think that's probably the thinking there. It'll be interesting. Um, We're a few days away, I believe, from Joey Gallo coming back off the IL. I think it'll happen this weekend in Philadelphia. How does that affect Manessas? I think Gallo is going to be at first base the majority of the time. Um, Maybe Manessas gets the occasional start there. Maybe he goes back to DHing at times. Or maybe there are days that he's actually on the bench, depending on how things go. Now, not that Joey Gallo has been anything close to a sure thing at the plate for them either. Um, but I think given the absences of others, I think Davies felt compelled to keep Manessas in a relatively um, significant spot in the lineup. And maybe as they start to get healthier, uh, that may not be the case anymore. Well, Manessas got on base four times in game one. So did Trey Lipscomb. Uh, Lipscomb in game one as an at starting third baseman and number eight batter. Three for three with an RBI single, two other singles and a walk. And he went three for three on stolen bases. Uh, he did commit a fielding error. Had some struggles in the field. We'll get to those. But Lipscomb, top of the second, two out full count single to center field. Lipscomb in the Nats three run fit. Leadoff single to left center on a one two pitch. Lipscomb in the top of the six drew a two out walk and had two stolen bases. And Lipscomb in the Nats three run eight, a one out opposite field RBI single to right center field uh, for a 5 3 Nats lead on an 0 2 pitch. And he had a steal 
of second base. And then Lipscomb in game two of the doubleheader as the Nats starting third baseman and number two batter. That was interesting. Uh, one for four with a single. Uh, he in the top of the six had a two out first pitch single into center field. Now, I mentioned the defensive issues. Uh, Lipscomb in what was a White Sox, a two run fifth in game one of the doubleheader. Uh, multiple bad defensive moments. The Nats in this inning were a mess defensively. Three official errors. There also was a pass ball on Riley Adams who committed one of the errors. But Lipscomb in this inning, he committed a one-out fielding error in whiffing with his glove on a grounder off the bat of Brian Ramos. And then Lipscomb failed to catch a one-hop throw from left fielder. Failed to catch a one-hop throw from left fielder Eddie Rosario for a throwing error by Rosario. Uh, off a one-out opposite field single by Nicky Lopez. The throw from Rosario wasn't great. I mean, I thought that that was a catchable throw, though, uh, that Lipscomb just did not make. So there was quite a bit going on with Trey Lipscomb uh, in this doubleheader. Yeah, I agree with you. It's a catch you probably need to make, although I understand why you give the error to the guy who bounced the throw, unfortunately. Uh, it was a very shaky inning for him there. Now, he wound up at first base later in the game when Manessis was pinch run for and started a really nice uh, play there to start a double play. So... Um, I don't know what entirely to make of it other than to say he is still a rookie. He's going to have his moments. We've seen some good moments from him at the plate and in the field. We also see some shaky moments. And I mentioned Joey Gallo coming back. There's a question here about who goes down when Gallo comes back. Officially, when he went on the IL, it was Lipscomb who was called up from AAA. Now, would they make that move and just make Nick Senzel the everyday third baseman? Senzel's not exactly hitting right now, and he hasn't played the field a whole lot either. Um, he has mostly been the DH when he's played. So I think there's an interesting question to be had there. I think, you know, 41 games into the season, you start to get a sense of who Trey Lipscomb is. I don't think we have the full picture yet. Um, he's had his moments, certainly. But I also think what we saw in spring training and in that opening series in Cincinnati may have set the bar a little too high. And he may not quite be all that everyone hoped he would be early on. That doesn't mean you shouldn't want to see more of him because he is potentially a part of the future. Uh, but I would not say that he's done enough at this point to just guarantee that he should be out there every day for the remainder of the season. It was a rough doubleheader for C.J. Abrams. Uh, he, for each game, was an at starting shortstop and number one batter. He, in game one, went 0 for 4 with a walk and two strikeouts. He, in game two, went 0 for 4. Abrams now, for this month of May, has the following slash line. Batting average of 192 and on base percentage of a 222 a slugging percentage of 235. He was so good in April. He is having a really rough May. Uh, K-Bet Ruiz, uh, another key mad uh, who at least had been struggling. He overall struggled in this doubleheader, but he had a big hit in this doubleheader as well. k in game one came through with a huge pinch hit. He and that Nats three-run eighth had a pinch tie-breaking one-out first pitch RBI single to right field for a 4-3 Nats lead. But uh, k in game two, as an ad starting catcher and number six batter, 0 for 4, his OPS for this regular season down uh, to 410. Great to see him get that pinch hit. I mean, we're, we're all like thirsting for any signs of K Bear finally getting going here. Uh, but then, you know, game two kind of uh, douses some cold water uh, on those hopes. So we'll see. Yeah, look, I thought it was a smart move by Davey to pinch hit him for Riley Adams, who had himself had a bad day, two strikeouts and a double play, and has really struggled here lately when he has had the chance to play. So I liked that situation, and it was good to see Ruiz uh, deliver with the uh, go-ahead single on the first pitch. He comes back in the nightcap, did not look great back there. Um, I don't know. He still just hasn't quite looked like himself to this point. Uh, I know you, I'm sure like a lot of people out there, have been excited uh, to see these new analytics that have been published by Major League Baseball with bat speed in particular. And Cabot Ruiz is very low on the list of major leaguers in terms of average bat speed. Not that we couldn't have probably said that anyways, based on what we see with our own eyes, but you kind of do see here how he doesn't swing the bat with a lot of authority. Uh, he does make contact that doesn't often lead to very hard contact. There was a nice single by him, but in the bigger picture, I think we can see maybe why he has been struggling at the plate. Yeah. There is an uncomfortable K. Bert Ruiz conversation that we may have to have at some point. I don't think we're there yet. I still would like to give him some leeway. He lost all that weight with the battle with the flu. 
you know, I think we're seeing with Eddie Rosario, you can't overreact to struggles for a month or so because things can change on a dime. So I'd like to give his season, k I'm talking about, a little more room to breathe before we have the big picture k Ruiz conversation. But he did not have a good season last season, certainly defensively. He's been kind of mediocre offensively as a batter these last few years. And now this season is not going very well. So uh, I don't think we're there yet at the conversation point, but uh, – uh, we may be getting there. We'll see. I mentioned Eddie Rosario. I bring this up just to say, because we couldn't do a show for Monday, do the rain out. He is the reigning National League Player of the Week. How about that? Uh, Rosario in this doubleheader had a hit at each game. He in game one as the uh, starting left fielder and number three batter. Uh, one for five with an RBI single. Did strike out three times. Did commit a throwing error. But he in that match three run fifth. A two out RBI single to right field to tie the game at one. And Rosario in game two as an ad starting right fielder. Number three batter. One for four with a double and two strikeouts. Top of the fourth. A one out full count opposite field double to left center field but that is something eddie rosario winning national league player of the week of how badly he had been struggling this season well now two weeks ago if i told you eddie rosario was going to win nl player of the week you would have said of course right that (laughs) you saw that one coming 100 percent uh not exactly no um and what's amazing you know mlb officially counts a week as monday to sunday if you included the sunday right before that is when he hit the first home run against the blue jays it was four homers in the span of six games For him, Um, really remarkable. Here's the other thing. It's the third time in his career he's won a Player of the Week award. Uh, And so Davey Martinez told him, hey, you know what? Why don't you go win Player of the Month now for the first time? Maybe Mr. May is going to keep this thing up for the whole month and really put something together and um, get an even uh, nicer piece of hardware or whatever the players get for winning uh, Player of the Month. Well, we had mixed starting pitching for the Nats in this doubleheader split at the White Sox on Tuesday. Uh, The 6-3 win in game one at Trevor Williams was the Nats starting pitcher. He allowed three runs, one earned in five innings. He gave up four hits, which were a home run and three singles. As yes, he did finally give up a home run. Uh, He issued one walk. He recorded two strikeouts, 81 pitches, 48 strikes, 33 balls. Uh, Williams in the bottom of the second gave up the homer gave up a leadoff homer by Aloy Jimenez to left center field for a one nothing White Sox lead of the homer when it projected 408 feet for Stadcast was the first home run allowed by Williams in this regular season this off Williams with the 2023 regular season giving up a National League worst 34 home runs it is remarkable how much better Williams has been this season at avoiding the homer uh, and then also with Williams in game one was him being plagued uh, by that aforementioned bad defense. Five of the fifth, he allowed two runs, but both of them were unearned as the Nats in the inning, like I said, committed three errors. Uh, there was a one-out fielding error by third baseman Trey Lipscomb, a one-out throwing error by left fielder Eddie Rosario, and a two-out throwing error by catcher Riley Adams uh, off a passed ball by Adams. Uh, that was something, the defense that was on display by the Nats in that inning. Yeah, it was really ugly. And unfortunately, this has been going on for maybe a week or so. A team that had looked really good defensively has all of a sudden turned pretty ugly in uh, what they're doing out there. Adams, I don't know what was going on on that one. It was initially called a wild pitch, but the, the pitch hit him in the mitt in the air and then uh, tried to track it down and throw him out and winds up throwing it away. So that was really bad. So Trevor Williams deserved better behind him in that inning for sure. Although at the same time, he did give up a couple of hits where he could have gotten out of the jam and minimized it and not left them uh, in that position. And the home run, look, he's done such a great job, of course. And the reason he's avoided that kind of contact is, especially with his fastball, he's kept it down in the zone. That one was 88 miles an hour right over the heart of the plate. What are you going to do about that? That's going to be whacked, especially with a hitter like Eloy Jimenez. So you just hope there aren't more of those kind of mistakes. If he can keep up the pace where, you know, it happens once every seven starts, then fantastic uh, you will absolutely be thrilled if that's the case. So he gave him the chance again, um, kept him in the game, and uh, ultimately the lineup bailed him out and the defense out in the end. So I get he's facing a weak opponent, but overall you can't be anything but pleased with what you've got from Trevor Williams so far this year. A- absolutely, and the final line is one earned run in five innings. So your Trevor Williams ERA for this regular season, 194. Eight starts, 194 ERA, the whip at 1.06. Hey, if he allows one homer every eight starts, I think we could all uh, live with that. And then the 4 nothing loss in game two, Mitchell Parker was the Nats starting pitcher. Three runs in five innings. He gave up five hits, which were a three-run homer and four singles. He issued two walks 
and a wild pitch, recorded three strikeouts, 82 pitches, 50 strikes, 32 balls. So Parker, bottom of the third, gave up a two-out, three-run opposite field homer by Andrew Vaughn to right center field for a 3 nothing White Sox lead. That homer went a projected 401 feet uh, per stat cast. But still, overall, you like what you're seeing uh, from Mitchell Parker. Uh, just that three-run homer in a lot of ways was the difference for him in this game. Uh, and it actually could have been worse because he left the game with the bases loaded, nobody out. Jordan Weems uh, put forth a tremendous uh, escape act. Phenomenal job by Weems. Bases loaded, nobody out. He gets out of it on three total pitches. Gets the one, two, three double play and then a fly out on the next pitch. So fantastic job there. And really with Parker, if you go back and look at the home run pitch, it's a splitter and it's down below the zone. So it wasn't a bad pitch. Maybe it wasn't a perfect pitch, but it wasn't that bad of a pitch. And I think you kind of have to just shrug that one off and say, oh, well, what are you going to do? I think the bigger issue for him was that he walked the previous batter, Tommy Pham, a two out walk. And the inning started with a bunt single that Parker, you saw the frustration from him. He felt like he should have been ready for that to go try to make a play on it. And instead, the ball just rolled towards third base and nobody could get to it in nearly enough time. So, um, you know, he's also been good at limiting home runs. And, and in this case, I don't think it was a bad pitch. The unfortunate part is that it was a three run homer because of some mistakes earlier in the inning. Uh, if you get the solo homer, not as big a deal. But again, big picture, step back and say, you have to be pleased with what you're getting from Mitchell Parker. He has given them a chance. He has not given up more than three runs in any one of his starts so far. And if I told you that back on Jackie Robinson Day at Dodger Stadium, if that's what he would be at this point, you would be thrilled to find out that that's what Mitchell Parker had done for you. Yeah, and I think that that's part of why Eric Fetty doing as he did on Tuesday night doesn't sting like it otherwise would. Two years ago, when Austin Voth was doing really well with the Orioles, that stung because you had the Nats as a really bad team having really struggled when it came to drafting and player development. And here you had a guy who had been bad for the Nats for years. He goes to this other team and from the get-go is really good. And even though both faded with the O's, the O's in like half a season got more production out of both than the Nats got over five seasons with the guy. And so that was a really painful issue. Here we are two years later. No, the Nats haven't arrived. You can't like plant the flag of victory, but things are going in a better way. And that was an interesting sort of juxtaposition of, yeah, Fetty doing as he's doing, but the Nats were throwing Mitchell Parker, and there's a lot of reason for optimism with him. So I do think that that takes away some of the sting of seeing Fetty uh, do well. Uh, the Nats bullpen in this doubleheader split at the White Sox on Tuesday. I tell you, more good work by this Nats bullpen. Over the two games, uh, one run in seven innings. A 6-3 win in game one. Four Nats relievers combined for four scoreless innings. Robert Garcia, a scoreless and hitless spot of the sixth. Derek Law, scoreless spot of the seventh. Hunter Harvey, a scoreless spot of the eighth. Kyle Finnegan, scoreless bottom of the ninth for the save. Despite giving up back-to-back one-out singles, and as Mark noted on X, First time since April 12th that Kyle Finnegan had given up a hit. He had tossed 11 consecutive hitless innings. And then the 4 nothing loss in game two. Three Nats relievers combined to allow one run in three innings. We mentioned the escape act by Jordan Weems. Faced two batters, got three outs, and on just three pitches, navigated his way out of a bases loaded. Nobody the out jam in the bottom of the sixth inning. Uh, Jacob Barnes tossed a scoreless and hitless bottom of the seventh. And then uh, Nats starting pitching prospect Jackson Rutledge came into the game. He earlier in the day was appointed as the Nats uh, 27th man for the doubleheader. Uh, he did give up a homer. Bottom of the eighth, Rutledge gave up a one-out solo homer by Andrew Vaughn uh, for a 4 nothing White Sox lead. But hard to ask for better uh, than what the Nats got from their bullpen in this uh, doubleheader on Tuesday. Sure. And I think the best part of it is you, what you worry about with double headers is you burn guys up and it leaves you in a bad spot the next day and the day after that. Well, in this case, they used, uh, what, seven of their nine relievers and everybody basically pitched an inning uh, and they're all in good shape, I think, for the next day and then an off day after that. So, I mean, they should be totally fine. Um, Rutledge, I thought, was an interesting call both to have him come up. He had started just three days ago at Rochester through 91 pitches. So it's not like he would have been able to give them a whole lot of length if the uh, situation arose. I figured he's just here in case of emergency. They're not going to use him at all. They did put him in there for the ninth. And instead of Dylan Flora, who I could understand, you say he's a higher leverage guy. Maybe you want to save him uh, for the series finale. But guess who didn't pitch at all in the doubleheader? Tanner Rainey. And if you're not even willing to use him down 3 nothing in the eighth inning, and instead you're using Jackson Rutledge, for ostensibly a mop-up inning uh, in, in between his two starts, 
at AAA, it tells you a lot about where Tanner Rainey is right now. And as we've discussed, how long can you go on like this, carrying someone who you don't really want to use in any kind of situation of consequence? Um, we'll see how it plays out on Wednesday. And again, they have Thursday also may not be a big deal, but that struck me a little bit, sort of like you didn't have to throw Jackson Rutledge at it. And you easily could have put Rainey out there and they chose not to. Tuesday was May 14th. Rainey's last appearance in a game was May 4th. Like, what are we doing here? You know, this isn't doing Rainey any good. This isn't doing the team any good with how aggressively Davey Martinez uses his bullpen for the team to be operating essentially a man short in the bullpen. You DFA'd Matt Barnes instead of doing something with Tanner Rainey. I don't get what's going on here. Like, you can't have it both ways. You can't want to keep the guy but then never pitch the guy. Like at some point you got to make a decision here. You're either going to keep throwing the guy out there and hope like heck that he gets right. Or you're going to make a move here and get somebody else in that bullpen. But what's happening right now, this can't go on. No, it can't. Now, for all we know, they are working on stuff with him. So they're using this opportunity to actually, you know, throw off a bullpen mound in the afternoons and try to get something right. But eventually you have to see, does it work in a game or not? And to me down three, nothing in the last inning of a double header that you already won the first game why not? Where's the harm in putting him out there? Now, maybe another situation will arise to do it. Um, but I, I kind of would have liked to have seen him there just if he could have given them a scoreless bottom of the eighth. It would have been a boost of confidence for him. And then that maybe made you think, OK, we're, we're on track here. we got something that we've got going right. If you never put him out there, you never know if you can fix him or not. Game three for the Nats at the White Sox Wednesday afternoon at 210. Patrick Corbin will be the Nats starting pitcher. Can we talk about the crowd? at uh, guaranteed rate field on Tuesday. Um, the crowd for game one of this doubleheader was as bad of a crowd as I can remember seeing in a regular season game. Now, look, the Nats are in the same division as the Miami Marlins. We know how that ballpark can be. But this was embarrassing. All of the empty seats that were there for this game one, game two was a little bit better, still not great. But game one, I mean, you put out a photo of what it was, but watching the game, it was almost humiliating from a White Sox perspective. This is a major league regular season game. And by the way, a major media market, Chicago, Illinois. And it felt like there were six people in the stands. It was incredible to see and hear. The number, I think, for most of that game had to be under a thousand. I think it was three digits. Um, you know, it was almost small enough that you could try to just count individual people that you saw out there. Um, now, look, it's a, a single admission doubleheader. The way that works is if you had a ticket to Tuesday's originally scheduled night game, you could also come early and get both games. And either people purposely decided not to or couldn't or maybe in some cases didn't even realize what it was because they bought their tickets way in advance and didn't know. And the official attendance for the doubleheader. And again, this counts for two games. 11,138. There were not that many people there for the nightcap either. There were some more that looked a little bit more respectable, but not a lot better. Now, the situation here, it's a terrible team. There is a lot of frustration around here. They went through a complete teardown of a team uh, that was that made the postseason a few times not that long ago. And the thought was, okay, they have a young core that's going to grow into something big here. It did not happen. And they've kind of started all over again. It has not gone well. It has not been well received in Chicago. Uh, Jerry Reinsdorf, the longtime owner, is not in good graces of a lot of fans. He's apparently trying to get a new ballpark built uh, to replace this, which, you know, of all the other things about the White Sox, the fact that this place, originally Comiskey Park, it was called, um, was built one year before Camden Yards and could not be any more night and day different from what Camden Yards is. There's nothing retro about this ballpark. It is huge. The upper deck is a mile high. Uh, it is cavernous. It has no charm at all. And it's in a bad part of town. Um, you put that all together and you can understand why even in a big market like this, there's a lot of frustration. Uh, where it goes from here, I don't know. It was disappointing to see it. I'm not necessarily all that surprised and I'm not even going to necessarily blame fans for not turning out on a cold uh, midweek afternoon for a doubleheader against a team that they probably don't know a whole lot about. Uh, but this is an organization that has a lot of work to do to win people back and try to get back to where they were when they won the World Series, uh, you know, only two decades ago. 
the White Sox are very much a cautionary tale for how a total teardown cannot work out. It was just a few years ago that people were talking about the White Sox as like a team on the rise and a team that was going to be really good, had all these good, young, promising players. You know, it's interesting, the final White Sox pitcher on Tuesday night, Michael Kopech, a guy who not that long ago was viewed as this high-level prospect. The White Sox got him in the Chris Sale trade December 2016. He did not look particularly good in his appearance on Tuesday night. And, you know, that's kind of uh, emblematic of uh, where the White Sox are at. But that is a uh, problem for the White Sox chat podcast, uh, not for this podcast. Uh, Hey, shout out to Frank Sears. A dedicated lifelong Nationals fan and D.C. native on his second wedding anniversary. Uh, This is read uh, not in my voice, but in the voice of his wife. Uh, We met in 2018 in time to enjoy the Capitol Stanley Cup victory. In 2019, we cheered and celebrated the Nats World Series championship. We even went to West Palm Beach for Nats spring training in 2020. Had our picture taken with the World Series trophy replica at the very last game before the COVID shutdown. Al, Mark, and Tim, we listen to the podcast every morning, and it would mean so much to have you. Shout out to Frank on our second anniversary today. Well, we say happy anniversary, and good on you for getting that picture in with the World Series trophy replica the very last game before the COVID shutdown. I know you remember that well. Uh, That is uh, getting something done in the nick of time, to be sure. That was quite a day to be there, and um, good on you, Frank, and, and your wife. Did we get her name in the shout-out? Uh, I don't believe we did. Well, anonymous wife of Frank, congratulations yourself, and good timing. Uh, Patrice, Tim tells us it's Patrice. Uh, good timing on all of your parts. You start dating, and you see the Caps win a Stanley Cup. Then you see the Nats win the World Series. And while things haven't been as great since, hopefully the marriage is even stronger because of the tough times that you've had to go through from a sports standpoint since then. And hopefully you get to climb the mountain back again. So congratulations to both of you on your second anniversary. Yeah, maybe renew your wedding vows and we can get another championship out of your relationship. I don't know how that works, but maybe we can uh, somehow figure that out. Uh, This episode of the Nats Chat Podcast brought to us by Roaming Rooster. Uh, Roaming Rooster proudly stationed in Section 239 at Dazzles Park. Left center field adding flavor to every game day experience. That's Roaming Rooster in Section 239. You can hit us up on X at Nats underscore chat. You can email the show Nats Chat Podcast at gmail.com you can find us on youtube just search that's chat our youtube handle is at nats chat podcast we have a website that we invite you to check out nats chat podcast.com in which you can purchase a nats chat podcast t-shirt all nationals radio highlights on that chat are courtesy of 1067 the fan for mark zuckerman i'm al galdi we thank you for listening and we'll talk to you next time on the nats chat podcast